You're listening to Trek FM. Hello and welcome to From There to Here, Trek FM's 50th anniversary rewatch of all 729 Star Trek adventures from Broken Bow, Oklahoma, all the way to Yorktown Base and Star Trek Beyond. I'm your host for today's episode, Lee Hutchison, and I'm joined by Davis. How are you, Davis? I am wonderful, sir. How are you doing tonight? Oh, I'm ready to finish Season 4 of Voyager and get go into brave new worlds of season five but we better get this uh, season wrapped up first eh? oh absolutely because i hear admiral hayes he's a bit of a windbag yeah i mean imagine she's gonna get court-martialed when she gets back home for that (laughs) so we'll start with hope and fear the season four finale finally decoding the message from starfleet they received months earlier voyager is directed to a nearby sector where an unmanned federation starship awaits them however Everything is not what it seems when alien technology is found aboard the new ship that doesn't seem very Federation-like. So, what did you make of the season four finale, Hope and Fear? Well, I, I really, en- I really enjoyed it because uh, Ray Weiss did a really great job as the alien uh, Octurus, and his species itself is one that was never actually named. He just went by designation, but. It was interesting to hear that his species and his civilization was always one step ahead of of the Borg. So, and for him to actually know also over four thousand languages, that was just insane. <laughs> He's a show off, isn't he? <laughs> Indeed. Like uh, I, I think it's a, I think it's actually really good. Like I remember being as a kid really frustrated because it wasn't like a cliffhanger. It was like a self-contained episode. I was like, oh, I, like as a kid, like I loved the Voyager two parts. They were like they were so big. They were kind of, you know, there was a lot of scope in them. So the idea of it just like ending for the season and not coming back like after summer and having a big episode to kickstart the season kind of felt like I was like, oh, I feel a bit shortchanged. So that took a bit of getting used to at the time, but I think, you know, watching it now, I actually think it's one of the best finales of Voyager. I mean, that's not overly saying much. I think between it's probably between this and Equinox for me for one of the best. I think it's actually a a wonderful reflection on the year that Voyager, I've, I've said many times, is, is too episodic for my for my liking. But like the fact that there's a lot of reflection on what we've kind of gone through in the year on season four of Voyager, how far um, you know Seven of Nine has come. I think it's a really good character piece, and you know we've got a ticking clock of will they get to Borg space before the end of the hour and be assimilated. And there's some interesting things here, you know, the the buzz of finding the new ship. I think it's a, a pretty wonderful kind of end to the year. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I like some of the little looking back hindsight now. The Dauntless was known as the NX-01A. Yes. You know, no no coincidence there. But, I mean, it's some interesting things that happen, just the interaction between some of the crew, like Bellana and Seven as they talk about Earth. Um, you see Seven trying to mimic more of her humor. Uh, one thing that I also saw that I thought was really good was uh, Seven and Janeway had that mentor-mentee ship that was actually going on. And it showed that Seven actually looks up to the captain. And even at one part toward the end, she goes, I can, I'm can. i here for you, Seven, but I cannot always be your friend. I'm, always, I'm the captain. And... I just I just thought it was just a, a unique way to actually look at how she was becoming reacclimated to being human again. So yeah, yeah, I think that's a really good point. That I think the relationship between the two of them are, is really quite interesting. That they're kind of you know butting heads. That they're kind of there's a lot of competition. That I think that we see sometimes that in like movies and TV shows uh, all too common that two female characters when it's there's competition between the two of them it's really bitchy it's over men it's the fact that it's just two proud women that are strong personalities that are just clashing and it's not over anything other than their their own you know selves I find that really quite great and quite unique within TV especially at the time you know you've got your Sex and the Cities you've got all these kind of programs where the onus is on the kind of women are competitive because of 
you know, money, power, financial, sexual. With this, it, it's because they're strong characters, and I think that's a credit to the the two actresses and some of the writing. Oh, absolutely, and you know. I, I really, like I said, I really enjoyed this episode, but uh, some of the little highlights, little tidbits that I thought was actually cool was they actually made it with the slipstream upgrades that they did 300 years closer to Earth. And Arcturus, who, who right before he tried to shoot them, before they beamed out, he used a gun that looked like it was from the black hole. Did you notice that? No, I didn't notice that. No, I just, like, I haven't seen that in a, a so, so long. All I just remember was, like, the tool kind of phaser thing. And thinking, oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. That, that was the first thing I thought. I was like, oh, that's what happened to the Palomino crew. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think there's, like, a, quite a few little nice little bits in this kind of episode. And it's, it's just nice that I think, and it shows a sign of confidence that, like I've said it before, that like season four is probably the highlight of Voyager. And there's that confidence that let's just to end it on a reflective note. Let's we don't have to you know push all the boat out to get people again in next year. We're doing really well. We've got the viewers. Things are going up for the the series in terms of you know viewers. You know episodes being excellent and like that's going to be enough to bring people back we don't need to get the cliffhanger and it's a nice little tradition break i think they they kind of went and it's a sign that of a year well done i think oh absolutely and i know this came out in 98 i want to say Mm -hmm. the next year i actually went to a convention in atlanta and i met the script writer at the time lolita fat joe i want to say that was her name and she asked everyone it says what would be the why would you want Voyager to come home so early or anything? And I asked her, I said, well, you know, having them come home after the Dominion War, you could see the ramifications of what happened to the Alpha Quadrant. So, you know, and, and those hopes right there, you're wondering, oh, are they ever really going to get home? Or are they just going to end it like they're still searching, you know? I think for me, I never doubted that they were going to get home, and I kind of maybe it was kind of the predictable nature of Voyager in terms of the writing and the production. That I was thought, yeah, they're always guaranteed to get home. I I didn't think that they would go with the kind of the bold idea of getting home early, maybe like half a season, or that they would not go home at all. I kind of always maybe expected that. Maybe I was being a bit naive as a kid, or maybe I was just kind of in tune with what Voyager was like as a production. So it was kind of never in doubt for me. I think. Ah. I hear you. I hear you. So and I, I would say that one thing that's worth checking out with this book is, uh, with this episode actually, is there's a book called Star Trek Action, which focuses on the the entire production effort behind making Hope and Fear, the finale of Voyager, uh, Tears of the Prophets, and start a scene from Star Trek Insurrection, and it's a really fascinating insight into how an episode is produced from start to finish to release. It's a very underrated book. It, you, it's kind of a hardback book and it's it's definitely worth checking out it's a real insight into what it was like to work on the set of voyager and you know in incredible detail so yeah it's worth checking out I'm, i don't know if matt rushing or anyone's done it on literary treks but worth checking out oh absolutely i have to check it on see if it's on amazon yeah so is there anything else you want to say about hope and fear before we move on to our next episode no i think we've covered it all now it's time for Time's Orphan. Some have described this as the worst episode of Deep Space Nine. What do you think? An accident on a planet sends Molly O'Brien through a time portal 300 years into the past and into an uninhabited world. Beamed back too late, Molly returns to the present, 18 years old, with no immediate recollection of her life and family and begins the struggle to adapt back to reality. So, Davis, what did you think of this episode? Well, not only is it called Time's Orphan, but it's also known as Family Time with the O'Briens. So, <laughs> I mean, it, it was it was okay. I mean, it wasn't like the greatest, but you get to see a little bit more of Miles. And, you know, I don't know if by following him and Keiko over the years since Next Generation, you always saw them like kind of bickering with each other, just trying to find their place with each other. And this episode, they actually start to click with each other i mean it was a pretty powerful statement when he said i will never ask you to leave again and she goes well what if what if the dominion come closer to deep space on he said then i will put in for a transfer i'm not leaving you anymore and i thought that was pretty powerful you know yeah and it's it's that kind of thing that 
I think it's interesting the kind of the dynamic between the kind of the, the husband and wife here when like Miles is thinking like oh what am I going to do that kind of that male cliche that the, the male's the thinker like he's going to be the, the one of action and he doesn't want to involve the wife but the wife you know is like well this is my daughter too I will face the, the consequences together that's what would happen in real life if I tried to do something like that if I had a kid and my wife kind of saw me she'd be like we're going to do this together none of this it's all on you or I'm going to take it as the kind of the lone wolf I think that's that's realistic and I think you, you're right they, they bicker and they don't often always click but sometimes that's married life I think and I think that's a, a good example in Deep Space Nine of of a normal life yeah absolutely and one of the other parts I do like about this episode is the B plot where you see Worf and Jadzia babysitting Yoshi and Worf knows that he's trying to prove to Jadzia he could be a good father. And I love the part where he just openly admits, I failed Yoshi, I failed Alexander. I mean, you hear him say that, and you're just, it's just really powerful saying mm-hmm. that. And Jadzia was like, You haven't failed. It's not, it's not the end, you know? Yeah, and I think what's kind of interesting is like uh, the production side of this episode. This that that plotline wasn't even cons- like in the original kind of outline. What it was that Times Orphan, the the whole plot with Molly, kind of came up like nine minutes short. So like, well, what are we going to do? Well, it kind of foreshadows what's to come in Tears of the Prophets. That it's a good opportunity to squeeze in a last bit of Worf and Jadzia time before fate intervenes. And I think it's you know it's a a really nice sweet kind of little plot line and you know times orphan gets called maybe one of the worst deep space nine episodes and it's you know it's, it's no great shakes but i think that b plot line is, is really nice and some of the the interplay between the o'briens is really good and i don't know about you but i've seen gordon ramsay's kitchen nightmares and you get to see the actress who played uh, keiko O'Brien, uh, molly o'brien as an 18 year old girl running a restaurant and she's quite different from the character that we see in Times Orphan so <laughs> there's a wee double double companion you can find out what happened when she was on the planet and you can find out what happened when she returned to earth in season 7 that she works in a sushi restaurant and ends up on a reality TV show <laughs> that's nice uh, well one more thing to mention about this episode is where was this artifact and which alien species just leaves a time portal around? Yeah, they've just vanished as well. Like, so did they all go into the past and then die? Or I, I, I have no idea. It's the biggest MacGuffin. Just like, oh, we'll just shove it there. It's it's just like lying next to this field. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I think, yeah, it's 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 an okay episode. It's, it's not anything special or great. And, you know, there's some nice bits in it, but ultimately in such an amazing season as season six is it's not one that i've probably revisited since kind of back in the 90s again so yeah it was nice to watch it again with some fresh eyes oh yeah absolutely absolutely so davies where can people find you if they'd love to get in contact with you and talk to you about these kind of episodes or hear your views on other such things oh you can find me on twitter at davisgrayson.com or you can actually find me popping up in trek fm's babel conference on facebook or you can find me on the Phantom Podcast Network where we talk about all things geek culture and Highlander Blood of Kings. And we also talk about Couch Potato Theater. So check us out. Lee, what about you? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Lee underscore Nostromo. You can find me at Star Trek VHS. And you can find me on my own podcast on the Nerd Party Network on my show, The Senate Floor, where I talk about geek culture with Tristan Riddell and Matt Hansen. So, yeah, join us again tomorrow as we finish up Season 6 of Deep Space Nine. There's going to be tears. Tune in tomorrow. Live long and prosper, everyone. <laughs>